G'day, welcome back to part three of the hydrogen lift FPV balloon system experiment we've been working on. People have said I look like Walter White. And they've said that with all this chemistry, it's looking a bit like Breaking Bad. I don't think so. But what do you think? Right, so now we've determined that the, the most practical way to make this hydrogen is still using the caustic soda and the aluminium or aluminum if you're in the USA. We've got to find a way to make this a less exothermic reaction. We don't want so much heat, it's causing a real issue. So, number of solutions. First of all, we'll use a bigger bottle. A bigger bottle means we can have more volume of liquid, it takes longer to heat. Uh, and we'll also use aluminium with a smaller surface area. Now, I'm going to use this. This is, as you can see, it's just it's coiled up aluminium. 1.2 millimetres thick, I think this is aluminium. And I've just coiled up a couple of lengths of that, so there's much less surface area for a given volume of aluminium. So this should react more slowly. The slower the reaction, the less heat, or should I say, same amount of heat, but it's, it's released over a longer period of time, so there's more chance for the fluid in this container to transfer that heat to the environment through convection and radiation. So the overall temperature should be low enough that we don't get water vapour streaming out the top, which is what we really don't want. So I'm going to use this. How much aluminium are we using? Let's just measure it, because everything in science should be measured. Let's turn this around so you can see too. And whoops, have to set the tear because we're on an uneven surface. There we go. So this amounts to 16 grams of aluminium, which is probably enough to get us a balloon and a, a few balloons actually. So they are small enough to fit in the top of the container there. And I'm going to make a much more dilute solution. I'm going to measure out my... Why is that going all funny? Oh, it's on an uneven surface. Oh, it's got something underneath it. There we go. I'll just check again, because this is going to... Because I want to be able to say, if you want to do this, I want to give you the... Go! What? That's better. I want to be able to give you the exact figures so that you can do this yourself. So was that... It was 18... 20 grams. 20 grams. Amazing. Gravity is fluctuating. Fear not. Yes. 20 grams. 20 gram. 19. Oh. Anyway, around about 19 or 20 grams of aluminium in this reaction. We'll see how much is left once we've filled our balloon. Again, we're just going to use a regular blow-up helium balloon here because we just want to measure some lift. We just want to measure the amount of lift we get from a certain volume of the hydrogen to determine how much hydrogen we need to lift our payload airborne. So there we go. I'm going to now go and do all the filling up and I will take you outside where the sun is shining for a change and it's not even that windy. Woohoo, here we go. Oh, almost forgot. Better measure the sodium hydroxide as well so we get everything right. And I'm going to put in uh, an equal amount of sodium hydroxide. 13, 12, 15, 19 grams of sodium hydroxide. That should hopefully be enough. And I'm going to use 300 millilitres of water in the container. So let's go and do it now. Okay, so, so here we are. I'm a little bit less um, high vised up than I was last time. Some people said I was over the top, don't know how that works. Got my aluminium, got my thing. I've got my cinder block again, just to make sure this doesn't um, get knocked over. And I bought two balloons in case I have a failure like I did last time, pre-inflated. So I'm going to drop my aluminium, look like that's gone, drop my aluminium into the bottle. And not much going on there yet, but I'll put the balloon over and it's going to take probably a couple of hours before we actually get any real significance out of this hydrogen production because of the much lower rate due to the reduced amount of chemicals we're using. There we go. So now we just leave this. Come back later. Right, so what have we got on the board here? This is a chemical formula. This is telling us exactly what happens when we mix our sodium hydroxide solution and our aluminium or aluminum. The reaction that we have seen can be quite ferocious, could generate a lot of heat and hydrogen. So we need to look at the chemistry of this. I said we'd science the shit out of this and this is where we get science in. So this is the formula for the reaction. So we have aluminium, AL, symbol for aluminium. Na is sodium. Why? Nah, don't know. Um, OH is, or O is oxygen, H is hydrogen. So 
Here we've got some more hydrogen over here, some more oxygen. So we, we, if we mix two parts of this and two parts of that and two parts of that, we get two parts of this and three parts of that. Simple as that. So let's, let's walk a bit through this uh, because it can be quite confusing. Not essential to this experiment, but I, you know, I want to teach you something while we go along the way. So this is a balanced formula. Everything that's up here in the input side of things is also down here in the output, but it's in a different bonding. It's formed new chemicals. Um, so what we've got here is two lots of aluminium because everything inside the brackets is two of, so we've got two parts of aluminium. And if we look down here, we've got two, there's the aluminium, so we've got two aluminium atoms, two aluminium atoms. We've got two sodium atoms, and because there's two of those sodium down here, that's, that's right, all the sodium and aluminium is accounted for. Now we have, in here we have two oxygen, and over here we have two oxygen. So we need to have four oxygen in the bottom here, which we do, we've got O2, but of course that's times the two here, so that's really four atoms of oxygen, so everything up there except the hydrogen is now accounted for, which leaves us with, um, we get two oxygen atoms from there, and we get two times, two, two oxygen atoms from there, so we end up with, sorry, hydrogen, excuse me, we get two hydrogen atoms from here, this is going badly, two hydrogen atoms from the sodium hydroxide, and we get four hydrogen atoms from the water, because we've got two times two. So we end up with two foot six hydrogen atoms which gives us three molecules of hydrogen. So two times three is six, but as I, as I said, well, as I'll show you shortly, hydrogen and oxygen are what we call diatomic. And that's not a Welsh farmer, no. Nothing to do with lamb or leeks, boy, or it's diatomic means that atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, if you leave them to their own devices, will pair up. They'll become good buddies for life. And so when you have a big bottle of hydrogen, even if it starts out as individual hydrogen atoms, they'll soon pair up and you'll have a whole lot of molecules which consists of two atoms of hydrogen. So we take six atoms of hydrogen, four from there and two from there, because of these multipliers, and we end up with six atoms of hydrogen, but they quickly become three molecules of, or three pairs, three molecules of two pairs of hydrogen, the, the molecules. That's what we have in the free space. So it's diatomic, and oxygen will do the same, which is why we've got, um, if you had oxygen in the air, it would be O2. And we always talk about O2, not O. We talk about oxygen. There you go. So that's the chemical way of doing it. And of course, one of the byproducts here, we're actually um, forming new bonds and splitting bonds. So heat is an outcome. It's exothermic. It's creating a lot of heat because whenever you change chemical bonds, it either requires heat to be put in or heat is liberated. So one's endothermic. If it, if it requires you to put heat in or if it generates, it sucks heat out of the environment or you've got to heat it to make it go. It's endothermic. And if it releases heat, it's exothermic. And we've seen this reaction can be incredibly exothermic, melts from a little plastic cup if I'm not careful, which is one of the problems we had. Everything was going too well in the first experiment with the balloon on the bottle, and we had too much water vapor from the heat, and as a result, just complete and epic fail. Now, the balloon outside is hopefully inflating as we speak, so we'll see about that later. Um, so that's our chemistry solution. At the end of this, we've got the salt here, which is pretty innocuous. It's not really, it's pretty benign salt, and we have hydrogen. So after we're completed, you know, this is not going to be an environmental issue and that's going to be floating around our balloon. So it's a fairly good process. At the end of the process, we don't have a lot of toxic stuff left over. And that's the good thing about this chemical reaction. Of course, we've got to make sure that this is taken care of the sodium hydroxide. So we want to create a chemistry where all of the components are used and we're not left with any of the original constituents. Then we've got a perfectly balanced equation. We don't have waste product, just this alumin sodium aluminite here, which is you know, don't eat it, but it's not that bad for you. <laughs> right, so, but some people mentioned electrolysis as an option for producing hydrogen. And a lot of people are very keen on it, but I'm gonna show you why, in this case, it's a really, really bad idea for making balloons. So let's talk about electrolysis, big word. If you're sesquipedalian, you'll love that word. If you don't know what sesquipedalian means, look it up. It's a really good word to know. You can impress people with the word sesquipedalian. Right, electrolysis. Electrolysis, let's do an electrolysis experiment. Let's say we have a beaker, like this, and it has water in it. Good old H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen bound together to produce water. Now, if we insert some wires into this beaker of water, like so, and we connect one up to the positive and one up to the negative, then nothing will happen. Yeah. If this is pure water, nothing will happen because pure water is an insulator. You might think, oh, but water, if I touch things when I'm wet, I get a shock. Yeah, because you're not dealing with pure water. Pure, what they call deionized water, doesn't conduct electricity. There's no free ions in it to conduct the electrons. So it's an insulator and you could sit there for a million years and all that happened is that the water in here would evaporate and your experiment would be a failure. So you have to add something. 
to enable, enable the current to flow through the water. And that's usually a very dilute acid or a very dilute alcohol. And surprisingly, one of our friends here is the good old sodium hydroxide. If you add just a few, little bit of sodium hydroxide in there, then current will start to flow and interesting things start to happen. Now, what holds the hydrogen and oxygen together? It's a chemical bond, but it's, it's based a lot on electricity. There's, there's bonds between those two atoms that stop them from simply falling apart and liberate, turning into gas. Water doesn't just spontaneously turn into hydrogen and oxygen. You have to force it. And so what we do, if we put this electrical field across the water, it actually rips the two atoms or the, the atoms of this water apart. In theory, well, in practice, that's exactly what happens. So the hydrogen is attracted to the negative electrode and comes off as bubbles. You get bubbles of hydrogen pouring off the wires. And on the positive electrode, you get bubbles of, anyone know? Oxygen, of course. So this is where you get your H2, and here you get O2. Why don't you get H or O? Because as I said, hydrogen and oxygen are diatomic. They love to be partnered up with each other. So you get two atoms of hydrogen making a molecule, two atoms of oxygen making a molecule. So the electrical field that exists between these electrodes rips the old H2O apart. The H2s go this way and the O's go that way. They bubble up. As soon as you get two oxygens forming here, they combine to make an, a, a molecule. So you end up with bubbles of H2 and O2. Simple, eh? I mean, how, how easy could it be? So why don't we use this method to fill our balloon with hydrogen? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And the first one is you've got both gases coming off here now. You can build a device like this, which has a wall down here, and then basically like this. So that all your gas for your hydrogen gas would go up here and out there, and you would have the same over this side for your, your O2, like so. So you'd have O2 coming out here, and H2 going out there, but it's a faff to do that. It's, a, it's an engineering job because You've got to use, a, a, like you have to use perspex or something, insulating a plastic material to stop all sorts of other funny things happening with the electricity. And then you've got to bear in mind that you're going to be generating twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. So you have more pressure on this side than that side, which means that the water levels will start going down like this because the hydrogen production will push the water up that way. And if the bubbles go through there, then you're, you're buggered. Um, and you've got to have enough water in there to start with. And it's just, a, it's a faff, it's, it can be done. It is done. Jewelers often use devices like this to make a gas or oxygen and hydrogen gas for welding jewelry. They like to weld jewelry with hydrogen and oxygen because you've got very, very fine control of temperature. It's a very intensely hot flame, but there's not a lot of heat in it. How can it be hot with not much heat? Look up the difference between heat and temperature and you will find out. Heat and temperature are not the same. Look at my video on RC model reviews about soldering. And I tell you the difference between heat and temperature. Very, very important distinctions, right. So you could do this, but look at, the, look at the work involved. And also, electrolysis isn't a very efficient way to make hydrogen. To make it using chemistry, we just throw some gunk in a bottle and poof, there it goes, woohoo, piece of cake. With this, you've got to provide electricity and a lot of electricity. It's a, although you only need about, I think it's 1.24 volts across your plates to get the electrolysis going, it needs a lot of energy. So I think it's about it 40 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. 40 kilowatt hours, that's a huge amount of power. That's the equivalent of running your electric kettle for 20 hours continuously. Woo! <laughs> so you're not going to be able to do this in the field with a soda bottle full of water and a 9-volt battery. Not going to work. So it becomes a bit impractical to do this anywhere but where you've got a power supply, it mains power. So yeah, and of course all this extra fluff. And then there's another real big problem safety. Now people say, oh, we've got this terribly corrosive sodium hydroxide caustic soda solution. You've got to wear the face mask and the full body condom. But this is actually more dangerous. Although we're only talking about water with a very, very dilute amount of alkaline or, or acid in it, this can be really, really dangerous. And I'm going to show you why. Right, this is one of the most dangerous things on the planet. It is a hydrogen bomb. It is, it is a disaster waiting to happen. It's what the HHO, the run your car on water people, called an electrolyzer. And it's a device that designed to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, but it has a fatal, fatal flaw that killed somebody in Australia just the other week. Headline here, look at this, here's the news report, see? Um, I'll put a link in the description, you can go see for yourself. 
What happens here is, yes, you have your plates, and there's lots of plates because you've got the maximum surface area, the maximum amount of electrolysis happening, and you have positive on one side and negative on the other, so you get all the little bubbles of hydrogen and oxygen coming up here like this and accumulating up here and then flowing out here, and we have the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. You might think, well, just put your balloon on there. Yeah, yeah, but that's not much good because um, oxygen is, is heavy. Hydrogen's very light, but oxygen is much heavier, so you're going to reduce the lift capabilities of your balloon because you're filling it with one third of oxygen. No, no, makes it like putting a brick in it. Don't want to do that. You want pure hydrogen. So for a start, this is not going to be an as an effective lifting gas as pure hydrogen. But then, but the real problem is, let's look at H2O. This is, I can't believe people don't realise this. H2O is what we call ash. It's ash. It's, it's just like, you know, you have a cigarette, stuff that's left, ash. You burn a piece of wood, ash, ash. How do you work that out? Well, this is the byproduct of burning hydrogen and oxygen. If you have a hydrogen flame burning with oxygen, the result is water. This is one of the big things about hydrogen as a fuel. The, the only byproduct of hydrogen as a fuel is water. Woohoo, fantastic. But that makes water ash. And you can't burn ash. You try and light a piece of wood ash, it won't light, it won't burn. It's already been burnt. So this is hydrogen that's been burnt. So this is what you get if you burn hydrogen and oxygen together. This is what we've got here. We've taken water, we've ripped it apart into the component parts, hydrogen, oxygen. Then we've let these gases come along here. They are the perfect ratio for recombining into water. But I mentioned it takes a lot of energy to split this water up. That energy doesn't go nowhere. That energy is effectively stored because we have created two separate gases. And if we burn those gases, if we recombine the hydrogen and oxygen, if we ignite this gas, all the energy we put in, almost all the energy we put in, is released very quickly in the form of heat. And that's not a good thing if you're trying to live for a long time. And this gas that comes out here is, is known, the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, what we end up with actually, I'll draw, I'll do the thing, it's actually 2H2 and O2. That's what we get. Because remember we've got H2O, so we need to have two molecules of water do it like this. And I already did the balancing, so two, two times two hydrogen is four hydrogen, so we need to have two, lots of two hydrogen. And because hydrogen and oxygen are diatomic, they always hang around in pairs, it leaves you with two oxygen. So you, that's what you do. You take two molecules of water, you end up with four molecules of hydrogen, oh, sorry, you end up with two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen. And those are what we call a stoic ratio. They're the perfect ratio for making an explosion. Not a good look. So the gas that comes out there, <laughs> <laughs> this is, every time I hear this, I just cringe because the scammers who tell you you can run your car on water by sticking one of these on it, they call this gas H-H-O. You see where they get that from? From H2O, two H's and an O. That's what they call the gas, which is utter bullshit because as we know, it's diatomic. So those two H's will combine into H2 and you get, so you'll end up with which, what we've got here. We've got, if we have a look at it, if we have h h O and H, H, O, diatomic, these two form a molecule, those two form a molecule, and these two form a molecule. So we have two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. There's no such thing as H, H, O, because the moment you create it, it forms into molecules. And so you get hydrogen and oxygen molecules. And that shows you, if you when people don't know enough about chemistry to realise that, you know the stuff they're telling you about how you can run your car on water is just utter, utter crap. Don't listen to them, you'll get it yourself. So H, H, O. No, another name for this is a thing called Brown's gas. So it has been used for welding and all sorts of other things, even joined together because there are some clever things you can do in engineering to, you might think if you light this, if you put a match up here, it's gonna burn back there and go boom. But there's ways you can stop the flame from traveling up there. Flame can only travel at a certain speed. So if you have a thing that reduces the speed of the frame front and the gas is flowing fast enough, it will always be blown out towards the tip and it won't go back into the bottle. But she's dodgy stuff, I tell you. And you don't wanna be filling a 50 litre rubbish sack with an explosive mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. It's, it's lethal, <laughs> it'll kill you to bits. So that's why we're not using this and why we're using the chemical method. I hope I've explained a little bit of it to you. That's the sciencing stuff. Got to get back to making the, the, the crystal meth now, but let's see how our bottle's going outside. I have a feeling I've used, <laughs> probably gone the, I've gone the wrong way now. I've used too small amount of our chemicals, too small a surface area. So I expect that our balloon will not be very much inflated, but we've seen the two ends of the spectrum. Then, then we can look at the middle and try and get a decent launch. But let's go and have a look outside, see how that's got on. Okay, that's utterly pathetic. Uh, 
don't think I need my safety squints on for this, it's actually quite warm. Um, but we just have very little hydrogen. It's fizzing away, but this bottle got a hole in it. No? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so the reaction's still taking place, but it's very, very slow now. Although, even though it is slow, there is a, uh, a definite warming. That's probably, I'd say, 30 degrees Celsius, and the ambient today is probably about 18. So, yeah, it's definitely warm and it's cloudy. There is a reaction taking place. Now, I think I'm going to leave that overnight because at this rate, it might be ready by the morning, which would be great. But there's certainly not a lot of water vapor. Um, we'll just see what happens. We'll leave it. Time is our friend. Uh, so I'll go and I'll render up this, and tomorrow, hopefully, this balloon will be fully inflated and we'll be able to release it into the skies after we've measured the amount of lift it generates. But it is quite cold. I'm not going to burn my hands on this. And uh, that's it for part three of the great FPV lift balloon, hydrogen lift FPV balloon video. Comments as usual, please, if you like, and uh, always keen to hear from people. Sorry I might have taken a few liberties with the chemistry, but hey, makes it easier, makes it funner than just sitting there getting glazed over. Although I noticed a few of you have got putty around the edge of your eyes. What's going on there? Thanks for watching. See you again soon.